um, ba basically compared to the stuff we've been doing. And, and I, I put this up. Uh, it's, it's on um, your website now. And what I used to do was just print this one out in the outline form, you know, without the text and graphics. But that, now, that, by the way, is an actual photo of an ancient Greek statue, you know. So that's a statue of Socrates, uh, actually uh, made by an ancient Greek sculptor. So, we, so we're pretty sure we know what the guy looked like, and we're pretty sure um, he was not a fashion place, right? Uh, you know, uh, several times in Plato's dialogue, um, it's mentioned that Socrates is a little ugly. Um, well, the word apology has a different connotation. I think I mentioned this before. In, uh, in, in Greek than it does here. I, if I apologize to you, one of the presumptions is that I'm wrong about something, right? Uh, but the literal root word uh, originally meant a, a, a defense. Um, you can see this root word and this meaning in courses like uh, in Christian seminaries, they uh, teach a course called Christian apologetics. Same that same word, apology, and 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 a seminary student who takes one of those courses is not learning to apologize for their faith, but but rather to try to defend it in the arena of ideas, you know. And so um, you know that's what apologetics uh, means. Uh, so it's the same kind of root word. So this is basically Socrates' defense at his trial. And contemporary lawyers, you know what they say about anybody who, uh, who wants to be their own attorney. The, the person who uh, wants to be their own attorney in court either has a fool for a lawyer or a fool for a client. <laughs> And given the outcome of Socrates' trial, maybe he should have, uh, you know, heard that advice at some point. Um, but so, so there were various charges brought against him. I I don't mention all of them, uh, but. You can see how they relate. For, for instance, look at the first one, that Socrates is guilty of wrongdoing and that he busies himself studying things in the sky and below the earth. Well, who does that link him up with? Um, see, the pre-Socratic nature philosophers, right? Remember, the average person is suspicious of these people, just in the same way that somebody who, uh, you know, might today uh, be suspicious of, of a scientist advocating evolutionary theory uh, or someone, you know, and, and and Socrates actually talks about Aristophanes by name as part of his defense and says, look, you have this ridiculous picture of me in, Ar in, in Aristophanes' play, The Clouds. Um, and even today we talk about a philosopher or somebody way up there in academia is having their head in the clouds, and that sort of relates back to that. Um, and we saw that Socrates and Aristophanes' portrayal was saying, Hey, there's no Zeus. Uh, you know, it's the clouds that make the rain. So Socrates is trying to distance himself from the views of the pre-Socratics. There is, there was some basis to link him up with them um, because he, in, in his earlier days, I remember he came from a wealthy family. We know this, as I said, because of the type of soldier he was in the Peloponnesian War. He was a heavily armored soldier, and, and you or your family had to buy your own armor. But he couldn't be poor. 
and do that kind of a poem. Um, and, and so he had, unlike Mino's slave boy, Socrates had a good education. And he was trained in a school founded by a follower of one of the other pre-Socratics, Anaxagoras. Um, so Socrates had an early training in his views, but that wasn't really what he was about. He was more about investigating issues in ethics and how should we live, um, what's the moral right way to live, what's a good life for a human being. So Socrates tries to distance himself from this charge, and he also says, look, you can bring these charges against any uh, philosophy, not just against me. Um, that he makes the worst argument the stronger. Now, basically, that links him up with who? The people we were studying last time with the sophists. In other words, even today, we use the word sophistry uh, as an example for bad reason. And the sophists, remember, for them, the important point was not whether your argument was a good argument in that it reflected the way things actually were, but could you win your argument? Could you convince people? Even if the reasoning was bad. So Socrates is portrayed as not being a good influence, as somebody, um, when, when you say that he makes the worst argument, and some people say the worst view appear the stronger, it's like he's taking bad views, because he's such a skilled arguer. And he teaches these uh, to others. Well, you know, we're, we see that. Uh, now, now, an, uh, an additional charge uh, has to do with the others. Um, briefly, I'm not, not going to go into this, but how did he get this reputation? Well, um, you know, that he, he was, his reputation was that he um, taught a certain kind of wisdom and examined others. Now, the apology is not as technical and precise in the issues it deals with as nearly every other platonic dialogue. Because it, it, it actually reads, um, pretty easily, because for the most part, it's autobiographical. You know, Socrates uh, tries to relate what got him into philosophy in the first place and into this quest that, that made him confront people in Athenian society about their beliefs. Um, what did the Oracle of Delphi? Well, the Oracle of Delphi was a prophetess, a priestess. And now this is a legitimate poem. This is the remains of the temple of Apollo at Delphi. Uh, so Delphi is a Greek city. Um, the oracle, an oracle is basically the mouthpiece of a god. And 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 of people, um, you, you know, even in like the play at the Rex, Oedipus the King, uh, you know, goes and consults the Oracle at Delphi. The Oracle held great prestige in the society. And you could go there and get direction for your life. Um, and, and so, basically, um, Socrates does not go there himself. But his friend, Terapon, uh, I'll bet you you don't have any friends named Terapon. Um, one of his oldest friends, um, <coughs> who was actually dead at the time of the trial. But he says, look, my, my friend Terapon went to uh, consult the oracle. And what she tells him is um, that there's no one wiser than Socrates. Socrates is the wisest man. 
And no, um, Socrates in relating this in part is also trying to counter the charge that we're going to see in a minute, uh, one of the other charges that, that he's an atheist or that he's abandoning the traditional gods of the city. Um, he says, wait a second. I, I mean, there's no reason not to think that this, this isn't historically accurate and that um, this event was a sort of watershed event in Socrates' life. Um, you know, it set him out in a different direction. Because Socrates says, well, you know, I don't appear wise to myself. So he says, well, you know, I, I need to kind of test out this prophecy, this utterance. Uh, he says, well, look, if I can find somebody wiser than myself, then I can, you know, confront the oracle and say, look, you said I was the wisest and here's, um, you know, someone else in the society who I've deemed as wiser than I am. So Socrates confronts people. Now, by the way, um, pay no attention to these pages because they refer to the actual edition that we were reading as part of the community college a long time. But now, these other pages are kind of interesting. 21A through C. Um, they, for, for scholars of Plato, they're called Stephanus pages, after a monk in the 700s AD who got out what turned out to be the standard edition in Greek of Plato's works. Okay? And they, they um, these, the Panis pages perform the same function as things like chapter and verses do in books like the Bible. Uh, in other words, if uh, if the preacher in a congregation, Christian congregation, says, well, we're going to read from the third chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Well, there may be people in his audience that have all kinds of different translations out there. And and the third chapter of the book of Matthew is going to be on any number of different pages for different people. But they all know, they all can be at the same point because no matter what page it is in your translation or your edition, the third chapter of the Gospel of Matthew is going to be the third chapter of Matthew, right? And, and, and Stephanus' pages are a way that um, scholars in, in, in things like essays and articles and books can cite Plato's works and somebody, no, ma no matter what translation they have, if they have one that has the Stephanus pages printed as well as the regular one, they, they can follow out a quote or something and know exactly where it is. So that's what those uh, numbers in the square brackets are, just an aside. So Socrates, how does he begin? Well, he says, I went out and I tested this utterance, and he talked about various segments of Greek society. And the first type of person he says he uh, met up with was uh, a politician. He, he calls him a public man. Um, who thought, uh, who had a reputation in the society. In fact, he even said, look, if I would tell you all his name, you'd know who it was. And by the way, how, how many people is he making this? How, how many people in the jury? 500, right? A huge audience in a kind of amphitheater. Uh, uh -huh. did, did you have a, a question? Uh, okay, so um, so at any rate, he says, I question him. And now in the apology, he doesn't go into detail on specific philosophical issues. Like like we saw he went into detail with Nino Slayboy or with um, the concept of justice. 
that he was discussing with Thrasymachus. Um, but he says that uh, I question him, and what is he doing this question? Well, um, basically the open marketplace, which, yes, was a market, but it also was where a lot of business was conducted. It, see, th this is why um, public speaking was so important because uh, making a mark for yourself in that society, establishing a reputation, often hinged on how well you could make your point in the public square, in the public marketplace, the agora. Um, anybody ever hear the term agoraphobia? Um, what, what, what is it, basically? Um, if I had agoraphobia, would I be here? Probably not. No, I'd be in my room. Uh, agoraphobia is a fear of ba basically of crowds of being out in public, you know, and, and, and it's a real, you know, psychological uh, condition. Uh, but it gets its name after the Greek open public marketplace. So, so in other words, Socrates is not. He didn't call up this man's secretary and say, you know, I, I got some issues I would like to discuss with him. You know, um, can you vote me 20 minutes in his office? Um, not, I, I, I'm not that horrible. But in other words, he didn't meet with this guy in public. Did, Socrates is confronting this man in the public open marketplace with people around listening to what he's saying and what he's doing, right? Uh, so he says, I ended up showing him up in public uh, that he really, and, and showed him that he really wasn't as wise as he thought he was. And we have an example of this famous, um, you know, world famous physician from Johns Hopkins at the prayer breakfast, <laughs> you know, and, and an African American at that, um, you know, made a lot of points against the current administration policies while the president is sitting two or three seats away and the president is kind of squirming in his seat there, you know, uh, we don't like to be shown up in private. We certainly don't like to be shown up in front of people, right? So, so what happens? Well, this is kind of, uh, you know, um, well, okay. Why did the guy, why did Socrates think he was wiser than this guy, first of all? Well, basically, the guy made pretensions to know things he didn't know. Um, and so this is part of what has come to be called Socratic irony. Wisdom for Socrates is knowing that you don't know and not pretending to know things that you really know nothing about. So Socrates literally says in, in the Jowett, you know, look, neither of us really knew anything worthwhile, but if I was wiser than this guy, at least it was in the respect that um, I knew that I didn't know about what I was talking about. He was self-assured that he did. And, and note, that's very similar to the attitude Trisimachus had. He knows very well what justice is and that might makes right. And Mino, who sat under Trisimachus, is pretty self-assured as well. So, so Socrates says, well, after you know that initial encounter, says, I, I, I went kind of systematically. I thought, this is, this is what I need to be doing. Uh, and I confronted people who had a reputation for being knowledgeable and wise in Athenian society. And specifically, uh, three classes of people, the politicians, and then the, um, the poets and the writers of tragedies and Rams. We're not going to worry about what Dithyram is. 
Uh, but, uh, and, and, and also we're going to see the crafts people. And he says, um, intending to catch myself be more ignorant than they are. Um, so he sets out on this quest uh, of confronting people, and so he he relates a little bit of what happens when he talks to the poets. And remember, the poets, it, you know, poets aren't real, revered, you know, looked up to in our society. Um, but in Greek society, they, they really were. And so he says, um, I took some of the point to the poets who had written them and said, well, and the assumption, I mean, what of the, think about it. How is it that an artist can create seemingly from nothing uh, a play or a song, you know, or a poem? How do you explain the phenomenon of artistic inspiration? Well, here in heart, I mean, um, the Greeks brought in little demigods, you know, little uh, miniature gods called the Muses, and the thought was um, that they were inspired by these um, spiritual entities in, in writing what they wrote. Um, and and, and do you even find this, by the way, in, in some passages in the Old Testament, where it says these prophets were inspired by God to write prophecies that they didn't understand? They themselves, you know, because they were supposed to be for the end times, not for then. Uh, and, and so Socrates says, look, look I took their points, but they didn't uh, even understand what their own points meant, because they were written by sort of inspiration, in other words, by assumption, by being inspired by the muses, and, and, and not by knowledge, like you would write your essay for hopefully the next test, not by inspiration, but by knowledge, you know. And so, um, so you say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, obviously, they didn't know a lot. They didn't even know the meaning of their own poems. Um, but to tie things up about the poets, again, he says the poets, um, by virtue of their skill at writing poetry, also thought that they were knowledgeable in other areas where they really didn't know what they were talking about. So, he, and he shows this to the poets. So, so again, he's, here he's confronting the poets in public. Um, and finally, he, he, he um, confronts the craftsmen, the technical people, the artisans. They are the Sometimes. Um, and Socrates himself was trained as a stonemason, as a young man. Um, Scholars I've read seem to disagree with themselves as to whether or not he actually used his early training in that craft, in that trade, uh, to make a living. And uh, it doesn't seem, if he did it, it doesn't seem that he did it very much, and he certainly didn't do it later in life. Um, but he confronts them, and he knows, because he himself has been trained, trained in, a, in a trade, he knows that in their area of technical expertise, they obviously have more knowledge than he does. So he says, in, the, in that narrow area, they were wiser than I am. But, again, he says they had some of the same problems that the politicians and poets had. Uh, he said this knowledge they had in their technical area, you know, today it might be something like computers, uh, 
made them assume that they had knowledge elsewhere uh, when they really didn't, you know, just like the poets. Um, and he says um, this claim that a lot of them had. Oh, okay. I just saw it up there where, where I left it. Um, and, and I will put a copy, a PDF copy on, on Blackboard for you. So, so at any rate, so Socrates says, look, this downside overshadowed any wisdom they had from the knowledge of the craft that they, again, claimed expertise out of their area. Um, so what did this type of investigation do for Socrates? We're people pleased to be shown that they did not know <laughs> especially in the public. Well, obviously not, right? I mean, you, you, you know what would happen today if you showed up somebody, uh, you know, on, on a national show or something. So Socrates says he, he even began to make some enemies, you know, especially among these groups in society to claim to be, um, you know, why so he acquired a lot of unpopularity. But um, on the other hand, when I say in one of Socrates' students, there were other people listening to what Socrates had to say, especially young, bright, you know, intellectual children of the wealthy. I like the way he's taking people down a peg. Don't we like to see that? You know, we like to see somebody who, you know, puts on a lot of airs and pretensions kind of get taken down a peg, you know, when it happens on television or some public show. We like to see that. So, um, <coughs> so he attracts besides making enemies of these people confronting, people, and, and some of the people he hears don't like what Socrates is doing and they're taking the sides of the poets and the crafts and all that. But other people like what he's doing and think Socrates is on the right track. So he attracts a group of young followers men who go about uh, kind of imitating what Socrates is doing. And so one of the things that comes of this is the charge that Socrates is somehow corrupting these young followers. Who have, um, and so in one sense, um, he, he's made them young upstarts, you know, um, they're going against the status quo. They're questioning either their parents or, you know, um, you know, the adults in society. They're young men, uh, and that's one way that Socrates was corrupting the youth, and that they were kind of following on the same method. But, but also one of the main, uh, and Socrates doesn't believe this has any merit. Uh, he, he doesn't think any of these charges have any merit. Um, you know, uh, he says, look, you could bring the same charges against any philosopher uh, and they would be vulnerable to the fact that they're, you know, that they have scientific interests, studying things in the sky and below the earth, not believing in the gods, or making, you know, the worse argument the stronger. Um, but one of the specific charges, and one of the main ways that they think Socrates is corrupting his young followers is, in, uh, is the, basically the charge of impiety against Socrates. You know, that Socrates is guilty, and this is pretty much a, a quote from the English translation, 
the Socrates is guilty of corrupting the young and of not believing in the gods in whom the city believes, but in other new divinity. In other words, that he's somehow leading his young followers away from the sort of accepted group of gods, Apollo, Venus, and the like, onto new new gods, you know. Uh, and so in that sense, he's corrupting them. Now, well, there are actually three prosecutors. Um, I, I'll put the names. I'm not going to ask you. But one of them was Miletus. Miletus. And Lycon. And what I always have tend to forget which one basically I mean, simplified things. Um, they sort of represented what we today would call special interest groups. The groups of people that Socrates was questioning, the politicians, the poets and playwrights, the craftspeople, you know. So he's got, but Miletus as kind of a main prosecutor. And now here we get a little bit of philosophy in a more, uh, and, and this discussion actually goes on for several pages. In the, the dialogue itself is around 50, 60 pages long. Right? So we're just hitting the highlights. Um, but Socrates said, well, well, what are you really charging me with here and charging me with impiety? Um, you know, are you saying that I'm leading the youth after other gods than those who the city believes in the truth of? Or are you charging me with atheism that I believe in no gods at all and that I'm trying to turn my young followers into atheists? And uh, this, this was part of what I edited out in the longer version of the PowerPoint that followed the whole dialogue goes on for several pages, but you um, know, and, and at some point Socrates is trying to say, look, these don't come to the same thing, and they don't, do they? I mean, um, so he says, well, what do you mean? Well, finally, um, he gets Miletus to say, well, I, I guess what you're doing is teaching them to be But Socrates makes some other points along the way where he tries to catch him in contradictory ways. Uh, you know, so this was one of the chief charges against Socrates, impiety or not believing in the Greek God. But no, the way he started out this dialogue sort of in some way addresses this charge, right? Because Socrates, he didn't like, yeah, God's fighting with God, God being acting immorally, um, but but he did um, have some belief in in the Greek gods, and specifically, uh, you see that he says, "Well, look, I thought I was in a lot of the direction for my life from." Prophetess who spoke for Apollo. So how can you think that and not have some belief in Apollo, you know, in her legitimacy? Um, you know, so it, it seems like Socrates is not just trying, uh, a, you know, a strategy. That they genuinely did think that he was getting direction from his life right from the god Apollo. Um, well, what is, um, what did Socrates say he was really teaching his young father? Well, it was basically to get their priorities in life straight. Socrates was not, was not against wealth, even though at this point he's fairly poor. Um, but now, now remember, this is, this is Athens. This is the birthplace of the Olympic Games. 
the fields where the Olympic Games were held were, you know, by the city. Um, so they venerated the human form. Uh, but Socrates says, look, um, what I really taught the youth was um, don't care for things like, uh, you know, their bodies and their wealth. And, and also he mentions prestige and getting a prestigious position. Don't care for that as much as for being the best, you know, as the state of your soul. In other words, worry first about being a good person, and that kind of stuff is going to come. Um, but, you know, the way it's put in, in the quote that you was used in the video is that wealth and things like that um, doesn't make you, um, you know, good, a good person by itself. But if you're a good person, those other things come to you, you know. So, you know, he was basically telling them to get their priorities straight, um, as well as their beliefs. Now, remember, um, he knows that they're probably going to, that there's a likelihood they're going to charge him with a death penalty. Uh, I, I think he knows that that's, um, but he says, look, I, I'm not going to fear death and okay, you're threatening me with possibly, um, you know, charging me with death penalty. But here he goes back to the fact that he thinks he's in, in, in this, um, in what happened to Carapon, and this sort of revelation about his life from Apollo. He thinks he's sort of commanded to do what he's doing. Rightly or wrong, I mean, you can agree or disagree, right? Uh, and we probably don't have one genuine believer in the god Apollo in the room. But it seems like Socrates sincerely believes this. And so he uses the metaphor of a soldier. Um, in the, if a soldier is commanded to be at a certain post, he needs to be there and, and should not abandon his post for fear of death. Well, how would Socrates apply that to what he was doing? To philosophy. What should he not do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, abandon his beliefs and, um, and also uh, basically abandon what he's doing in doing philosophy and confronting people about their own beliefs. Uh, in other words, he says, look, just because you're threatening me with death penalty, I, I'm not going to ban him, I'm not going to stop doing philosophy. Um, you know, he says, I, I've been commanded to do this. And so he goes on and he says, look, um, let me cut you short here. I would not accept any kind of a plea deal where you'd say, look, Socrates will drop the charges just as long as you live quietly and stop doing what you're doing. You know, live out the rest of your life, um, you know, and stop doing philosophy. He says, I, I would not accept acquittal on the grounds that I stopped practicing philosophy because, he says, I, I think I was commanded and, and this is actually a picture of an old Greek statue uh, of Apollo, okay? Um, and, and, and you can really see the anthropomorphic, uh, you know, way they represented their gods. So they represented their gods in the form of human beings. Um, as I say, their, their argument basically was, well, no one's ever seen reasoning in any other form than human form. So if the gods are rational beings, reasoning beings, they must have human form. <laughs> now that might not seem a very good argument to you and me, but it seemed like a good argument to them back then. So, so Socrates says, you know, I'm like a soldier commanded to do what I'm doing. 
And I wouldn't accept any plea deal that had as part of it that I stop doing what I'm doing. Well, here's the, the famous um, gadfly uh, uh, metaphor. Um, what does he see as his function? Well, to be like um, a gadfly is a type of horse. Um, people of Athens are like the big old racing horse out there. You know, self-satisfied. Um, in, in their belief that they're right and everything, you know. He says, what you need is somebody to come along and uh, get you out of your comfort zone, you know. That the people, just like the big old horse out there in the field needs to be stung by a horse fly, he says, um, I need to stir up people in the city uh, who become, you know, sluggish and self-set in their ways and unwilling to examine, you know, their own beliefs. And, and, and we'll see this in the allegory of the cave, how important uh, examining our own um, beliefs was uh, and played out. Um, oh, yeah. We got 15 and 20 minutes. We're good. So, um, again, he says people like to follow him because they like to see him question others, you know, uh, and so, so what, what did you, what was the verdict of the jury? Uh, the, one of the votes is given in your vote, um, did they vote guilty or innocent? Guilty, right. Um, we, okay, if there were 500, some would say 500 more, so there's but if there were 500 jurors, how, how do we get that figure? Well, Socrates makes the comment that the vote was so close that if it, if 30 people had voted in the other direction, it would have been quick. So out of 500, you get that 280 to 220. Now, the thing is, the jury actually took two votes, not just one. Because, so they, they now, I, and, and uh, I, this is one of those things where it wasn't guilty by 60 votes. It was guilty by 30 votes. The whole spread is 60 votes. Um, yeah, no, I guess that's right. Uh, uh, but at any rate, uh, it, out of 500 people, the vote was reasonably close. You know, um, so his prosecutors obviously want to vote for the death penalty. I mean, you say, well, that seems pretty extreme. I mean, these don't seem that bad to start. Um, and, and, and we already saw that Athens was a little bit freer society in a, a lot of the surrounding societies. Now, now, there are a couple of takes on this. One was that during the Peloponnesian War, Socrates actually sided with a group of generals against the young democratic government of Athens. But like there was in South Africa, when, um, when, when, um, after party, um, declared a blanket amnesty. And uh, an amnesty was declared after the Peloponnesian War. So one tax scholar's take on this, and I'm not going to answer this on the test, was that um, they couldn't charge him with the real charges they would have liked to bring against him. So they threw out these trumped up charges. Because the real charge that he had sided with the generals against the Athenian government was under the amnesty, and they couldn't bring those charges. Now, I don't like that answer because you, you said, well, why did they wait till he was 70 years old if they wanted to do that? Because he did that when he was a much younger man. Why didn't they bring it, you know, this trial back? 
Um, but a, a, another explanation was that he was really getting in people's hair. And they didn't really want to tell him. But they did want him to go or be quiet. You know, stop confronting people. You know, stop upsetting things in Athens. And remember, this is the seat of democracy, but the young democratic government of Athens is still on a really shaky footing. You know, and so they're not real comfortable in their own uh, power. So at any rate, the thought was, if we threaten him with death, um, maybe he will propose a different penalty and we can get him out of here. See, because <coughs> for, for a while where there was no stipulated penalty on the books, and, and you can see these are odd charges, to say the least, right? Um, Athenian law basically um, accounted for that by um, letting the prosecutors propose a penalty. And in this case, in the lead of someone who prosecutes, but we, we want the death penalty. But the prosecutors knew that under law, Socrates had, or somebody representing him, of course, he's representing himself. Had the ability to propose a counter penalty in what we today would call a penalty case of the trial. And so, what happens to make it fair then is the jury has another vote. Are they going to take the accused proposed penalty or um, the prosecutor's penalty? And juries back then weren't very different from juries today, but very often juries would. Or, or, or even a judge who tends to say the last of the two possible penalties. So the thought was if they scare him with the death penalty, he'll propose something like exile. And so the jury is lenient, they're going to take the death penalty. They vote for exile. We decide to keep that out of the way. So we're only trying to scare him with the death penalty. We don't really want to kill him. But what does Socrates do? Well, he says, look, I, I, I think these are trumped up charges. I think I've been convicted wrongly. He even said, at one point says his prosecutors are doing more harm to their own souls by convicting an innocent man than, uh, than the harm they could ever do to him, even if he gets the death penalty. Because he believes there's an afterlife, um, and the prosecutors will fare worse than he does. So what does Socrates do? Well, we already saw that he's a really in-your-face kind of guy, right? This is no quiet, um, you know, introverted homebody of a scholar. I mean, he. Um, He's out there confronting people every day. He was really kind of a man's man. Remember, the guy was trained as a stonemason and fought as a heavily armored soldier in the Peloponnesian War. So what Socrates says is, you know what? I am such a national treasure. This is basically what he's That I should not need to worry about where my next meal is. I need to be freed up to do what I'm doing and continue confronting you about your beliefs and your reasons, uh, you know, and your views of what is the good life. And so, you want a penalty? Here's a penalty. Give me a state pension. Give me free will meals for life in the lavish state dining hall. Now, this is not a real picture of that. Um, I don't know whether it's ruined still exists. But the, the closest thing today would be uh, maybe the congressional, you know, cafeteria down there in the Capitol. Um, and, and, and who ate there? Well, the big wig politicos 
Um, anybody <coughs> catch who also would be there? Well, think about it. In the Olympic Games, what did you get if you won? Well, you got a you know, crown of laurel leaves. Well, you know, that's not a lot. I mean, there weren't Nike shoe contracts back then. You couldn't get, you know, your uh, picture on a weaving box. So how did these, the cities where the athletes came from, not just athletes, not just athletes, but some other cities, how did they reward their athletes? Well, this was one way, giving them the state pension. In, in other words, you're saying, look, you, you want to honor me when you do the Olympic athletes because I'm such a, a treasure to the city and give me a pension in this, you know, give me free meals for life in this lavish state dining hall. Well, does that sound like much of a penalty? It's not a penalty, right? Um, so the, the point is, now, now your book only has the first jury vote. But they vote again, and I don't know if we know the exact numbers. I, I forget. Um, but I do know this, that the second vote was not close, because the jury didn't have a real option, right? They're not going to give him a state pension, so they do vote for the death penalty. You know, um, so, again, he says, why... Am I not just going to go into exile? Well, it, it, again, he gives the same answer. It would be like disobeying the God. And, and, and also he, he says that probably the same thing would happen elsewhere. You know, um, I would alienate people. But by the way, I mean, one charge, when they pick up the charge against uh, of his corrupting you, um, anybody pick up how, how old he is now? He's not a young man. He's actually 70 years old. Um, he's been doing this for years, right? <laughs> he, he relates how he got into it at the start, but he's been doing this for years. And I mean, this is like the kind of thing you see with people who are now adults and, you know what? I was corrupted and molested by that. But I mean, this has been a topic in the Catholic Church. It came up recently. You know, in other words, you find people who are now adults who aren't afraid to come forward when, when they would have planned up with children. And, and, and the thing is, when, when they consider this charge, whether Socrates was corrupt in the view, there were now people who were adults, who were self-sufficient, powerful, and they could have testified against Socrates and one of the things Socrates does is he, he points to the fact that nobody is coming forward and saying, well, Socrates is going to be in my mind. He really corrupts and means he is. You know, uh, and, and he says, well, this is another piece of evidence that I wasn't really corrupting the youth. Well, we have this famous quote, the unexamined life is not worth living. Examining your beliefs, the reasons for them, part of what Socrates uh, Socrates thought philosophy should do. But also, you know, again, he's teaching the youth to get their priorities in life straight, to figure out what it is to live a good life. You know, and, and to worry first about what it is to be a good person in life and, and other things second, you know. So, um, so what was the jury's vote? Yeah, well, obviously, they, they voted for death and... and he drank the hemlock, um, and and his friends offered to bail him out of jail. And, and remember, they're wealthy, and the jailers aren't. Um, but he, uh, he he goes through several arguments, saying um, he thinks it would be the morally wrong thing to do, so he's not going to do it. Um, you know. Oh, okay. Uh, well, well, look at. 
the PowerPoint, I made it, I made this one, uh, I uploaded this one because I didn't even have it on Blackboard, but I also made visible uh, a PowerPoint on Plato's forms that relates to the allegory of the cave. Uh, now, now again, here the theory of the forms comes from the middle dialogue period, from the Republic, and and you say, well, wait a second, wasn't Socrates in this early dialogue to say, I, I wasn't as concerned about the kinds of things that the um, the 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 pre-Socratic nature philosophers were concerned with getting out of elaborate theories of reality. Or you can say, well, you got this elaborate theory of reality that reconciles Heraclitus and Parmenides. What's going on? Well, you know, the, the version that seems most plausible to me is the one that says the early dialogues, Nino, Vito, the Apology, um, they probably are giving you a, a, a closer picture of the real Socrates. As you get on, you have more Socrates appearing um, and, and Plato putting his own more developed, more technical views into Socrates' mouth. You know. um, so I think it, it's true. Socrates wasn't as concerned to get out of elaborate views of reality. But he did have the rudiments of this view. Socrates, did, and there were people alive who knew very well what Socrates believed. You know, so Plato, even though he's getting out these theories in, in, in more detail, is probably not totally coming against what Socrates actually you know, believed. But Socrates, again, wasn't as preoccupied with the metaphysical issues that they create the Okay, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see you uh, next time. Have a great weekend. And, and look over the PowerPoint and, and do the readings on, uh, on Plato's theory of reality, uh, theory of form. And uh, if anyone came in after I call the roll, uh, let, let me know you're here.